Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Lidar Grave Lazian coming up in today's newscast. Day 222 of the war in Gaza as the IDF expands its operations in Rafah. On the northern front, one Israeli was killed and five injured from a Hezbollah missile attack. And how did Israelis celebrate Israel's 76th birthday amid the ongoing war? Day 222 of the war in Gaza. The IDF suffered its first fatality in its ongoing operation in Rafah. Tanks moved deeper into eastern Rafah amid ongoing gun battles between Israeli soldiers and terrorist gunmen as Israel confronts the last remaining Hamas battalions. More on this from ILTV's Steve Leibovitz. Israeli tanks moved deeper into eastern Rafah, reaching some residential districts where more than a million people have been sheltering after being displaced from other areas in Gaza. The tanks advanced west of Saleh al-Din Road and into Rafah neighborhoods. They are now on the streets inside the built-up area, and there are ongoing clashes between IDF soldiers and Hamas gunmen. The IDF said its soldiers had eliminated several armed cells in close quarter fighting on the Gazan side of the Rafah border crossing with Egypt. On the east side of the city, it destroyed cells of gunmen and a launch post from where missiles were being fired at IDF troops. The IDF said that during Israel's Independence Day, troops killed more than 100 terror operatives across Gaza amid operations in Rafah, Zaytun, and Jabalia. Since the beginning of the Rafah offensive last week, the army said that 10 tunnel systems had been located. Israel is directing residents of some Rafah neighborhoods to relocate. The United Nations says that about 450,000 Palestinians have left Rafah as the IDF escalated its operations in the Gazan border city. Prime Minister Netanyahu said that the war would continue until victory. <laughs> As Israel proceeds cautiously in the Rafa operation, the U.S. signaled its approval by announcing $1 billion in military aid. President Biden told key lawmakers that his administration is sending a new package of arms and ammunition, tanks and tactical vehicles. It's the first arms shipment to Israel to be announced by the administration since it put another arms transfer consisting of 3,500 high payload bombs on hold. The administration paused that earlier transfer to prevent Israel from using the bombs in its growing offensive in the crowded southern Gaza city of Rafah. Israel bonds the heartbeat of solidarity, the powerhouse of support. When the Hamas-Israel war hit, Israel bonds stood tall, proving we're more than just an investment, we're a lifeline. Investing in Israel bonds isn't just a financial move, it's a declaration for resilience, strength, and a better future for Israel. Join us and let solidarity echo through generations. And Israel's operation in Rafah is also causing increased tensions with its neighboring Egypt. This after Israel entered Rafah in a limited operation to seize control of the border crossing a site that Israel maintains is being used by Hamas to smuggle weapons into Gaza. Tensions between Israel and Egypt are heating up. According to a new report in the Washington Post, Egypt has threatened to suspend its peace treaty with Israel and stop acting as a mediator in hostage deal negotiations with Hamas after Israel captured the Gazan side of the Rafah border crossing with Egypt. Egypt has also blocked humanitarian aid trucks from entering Gaza through the Kerem Shalom border crossing in protest, a move denounced by Israeli Foreign Minister Israel Katz. Israel has long maintained that Hamas has been using the Rafah crossing to smuggle in weapons via its vast terror tunnel network. Yet so far, aside from taking control of the crossing, Israel has refrained from launching a full-scale operation to defeat Hamas's remaining battalions in the city. 
Israeli Hebrew news site Walla reported that the head of the Shin Bet, or Israel Security Agency, spoke with his Egyptian counterpart over the rising tensions. Israel is reportedly prepared to accept any agreement that does not involve Hamas control of the area. Meanwhile, Egyptian and Qatari-mediated talks have stalled since Hamas's ploy last week to accept a non-existent ceasefire deal in an attempt to delay the Israeli invasion of Rafah. Well, it's been... Uh actually a very long process uh, and especially in the past few weeks we have seen some momentum building but uh, unfortunately things didn't move in the right direction and uh, right now uh, we are in, in a status of almost a stalemate uh, of course uh, what happened with Rafah has set us backward a little bit. Talks are set to resume next week in Doha the little optimism at reaching an agreement remains. And joining us now with more on the war in Gaza on day 222 is Professor Kobe Michael, senior fellow at the Misgav Institute and the Institute for National Security Studies. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So we saw the limited expansion uh, of the IDF operation in Rafah. Is this the beginning of a major operation or is Israel still holding back? It depends. Um, the IDF makes uh, all the preparations uh, towards uh, the expansion of the operation in Rafa. And by the way, not only in Rafa. The IDF uh, is operating now uh, in two additional uh, areas in the Gaza Strip in a very intensive manner. Um, but I think that uh, if uh, there will be a sort of a breakthrough in the negotiation, then uh, Israel will have uh, the the, the operation in order to uh, assure progress in the negotiation. I don't see any uh, um, indications or positive indication for a breakthrough in the negotiation. And therefore, I think that the IDF will continue uh, operating in Rafa, uh, expanding the operation. It will be uh, in a very cautious manner. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think that uh, it will be uh, accomplished as a military operation. And, you know, the Biden administration uh, just last week said it was withholding weapons shipments to Israel should it go forward with uh, a Rafah operation. Yet Israel seems, uh, as you said, to be moving ahead with its plans. Prime Minister Netanyahu has even said Israel will go at it alone if necessary. But now Biden is reportedly moving ahead with sending uh, $1 billion uh, in aid to Israel. So has the administration you turned, are they now on board with a Rafah operation? I mean, what's going on here? I think that uh, the American administration uh, begins understanding that it was a mistake, uh, at least uh, in the way that it was done, uh, in a very public manner, and in a way that it was uh, interpreted by Hamas and the entire uh, Iranian axis as uh, something which is uh, very problematic from, uh, uh, for Israel. And uh, it was an incentive for Hamas leadership to remain in its uh, uh, position with regard to the negotiation. And it was uh, a positive incitement for, uh, uh, for Hezbollah to continue expanding the war in the north. Um, but uh, I, I hope that um, this is uh, the beginning of, uh, of I would say, um, the, the fi fixing the the, the wrong decision that was made by the, the American administration that was criticized, by the way, by, by, by not only by Republicans, but also by Democrats uh, in the Congress. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, Israel and the United States will find a way to reach uh, understandings between of them, because this is something that projects negatively on Egypt as well. And I think that uh, at least... Uh, a partial explanation to the change in the Egyptian policy uh, is is there. I mean, uh, the American uh, the American uh, behavior of the, the American policy towards Israel. Mm -hmm. And you know, Israel has also repeatedly said that Rafah is the key to victory. Uh, yet, some senior U.S. officials are saying, uh, at least according to reports that even if the IDF were to take Rafa, it won't be able to fully uh, eliminate Hamas. I mean, what are your thoughts on this? Rafa is not the key for the victory, but uh, Rafa is very essential, very significant for the victory. 
And uh, the victory uh, will be uh, achieved or realized when uh, the IDF uh, will dismantle uh, successfully and effectively all the major centers of gravity of Hamas, governmental and military centers of gravity. And Rafa is another center of gravity, but not only the four battalions. Uh, I think that Philadelphia Corridor and what is beneath this corridor is even more essential um, and uh, must be blocked uh, by, the, by the IDF in order to prevent um, the Hamas and other terror organizations from using it as the oxygen pipe for, uh, for their uh, recovering or, uh, or regrouping. Um, and uh, I think that we have to distinguish between the idea of eliminating Hamas as a sovereign power in the Gaza Strip and eliminating Hamas as ideology or eliminating Hamas by reaching to the last terrorist or to the last RPG. The, the objective of the war is to dismantle Hamas as a sovereign power in the Gaza Strip, to assure that Hamas will not be able to recover itself as a sovereign power, and Hamas will be out of the equation in any future political arrangement in the Gaza Strip or in the entire Palestinian arena. And I think that these objectives can be realized. All right, Professor Kobe Michel, thank you so much for your analysis today. Thank you for having me. Experience the power of truth with ILTV News. If you're looking for quality content and captivating visuals, join our news community and become an integral part of our team as we embark on a mission to unveil the real Israel, dismantling the web of lies and misinformation that surround reporting on Israel. By subscribing to ILTV News, you will not only have access to the latest updates, but you will also amplify our message, creating a ripple effect that carries the truth far and wide. Subscribe today and help reshape the narrative. Available on the web, Android, and Apple. And moving on to the Northern Front, cross-border exchanges continuing and heating up as one Israeli was killed and five others injured by a Hezbollah missile fired into northern Israel. ILTV's Steve Leibovitz has the details. A civilian was killed and five troops hurt by a Hezbollah anti-tank guided missile fired into northern Israel. Hezbollah had targeted a military position near the northern community of Adamit. At least three missiles were launched in the attack. The civilian arrived at the military post to provide assistance following the first missile strike that wounded the troops. He was hit by a second missile. The man later died of his wounds. A third missile struck the tether to an IDF observation balloon, which floated away and landed in Lebanese territory. Israel struck back. The IDF said it targeted buildings used by Hezbollah in southern Lebanon's Atya Ashab and Kafr Kila in response to the attack. Later, a top Hezbollah field commander was killed in an IDF drone strike near Tyre. Hussein Maki was a senior commander in the terror group's so-called Southern Front Unit. The IDF said Maki planned and carried out many terror attacks against Israel during the cross-border exchanges. So far, the skirmishes on the northern border have resulted in 10 civilian deaths on the Israeli side, as well as the deaths of 14 IDF soldiers and reservists. Hezbollah has named 298 members who have been killed by Israel during the ongoing skirmishes, including 30 commanders. And now some major news you might not have heard about. The United Nations last week very quietly adjusted its estimates of Palestinians killed in Gaza, cutting in half the number of women and children identified as killed in the war. Yes, you heard that right. There should have been a major announcement, the UN admitting that it doesn't have the data on the figures for over 10,000 supposedly killed women and children, even though it has been spouting this as fact for weeks. But instead, this was quietly swept under the rug. The UN said it bases its figures on the Gaza Health Ministry, otherwise known as Hamas. And what we do know from past experience is that Hamas often exaggerates its numbers or outright lies uh, about death tolls to boost the numbers, as it did earlier in the war with the Al-Ali Hospital in Gaza City where Hamas initially said over 1,000 people were killed in an Israeli airstrike. And after multiple external and independent investigations, it was discovered that only a few dozen were killed, and not by Israel, but by a Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket. 
So what do the figures show? The data now differentiates between the total number of deaths reported by Hamas, which stands at over 34,000, and the number of actually identified deaths at around 24,000, a difference of 10,000 people. With regards to women and children, initially it was reported that 9,500 women and 14,500 children were killed in the war, accounting for 69% of all the deaths. But now the UN is saying that 24,686 are actually identified, 4,959 women and 7,797 children, half the previous estimates and a further 11,930 are in fact men. What's more, the death toll does not differentiate between the number of youth under the age of 18 who were active members of Hamas, taking full part in attacks against Israel. Meanwhile, Israel has said it's killed around 14,000 to 15,000 Hamas terrorists, which means the real casualties of this war to date stand at around 10,000 civilians, far from the figures being presented by Hamas and its supporters. But what these figures clearly show is that what's happening in Gaza is far from the cries and narratives being pushed by pro-Hamas supporters that Israel is conducting a genocide. There are over 2 million people in Gaza, and so the latest accurate UN figures show that only between 1.2 to 1.7 percent of the population has been killed, including Hamas terrorists. Of course, every child killed in Gaza is a tragedy. This is the horrible nature of war. But if anything, these figures provide even more proof that Israel has one of the lowest civilian to combatant casualty ratios in the world and does all it can to safeguard the lives of Palestinian civilians. And moving on, while Israel's Independence Day is typically a joyful occasion, this year celebrations were toned down as the Israeli people celebrated a somber holiday amid the ongoing war. ILTV's Rachel Safdie has the report. Every year, the Israeli people celebrate the independence of the state of Israel. While crowds still gathered to commemorate Israel's 76th Independence Day, a stark mood hung over this year's celebrations, overshadowed by the lingering effects of the devastating October 7th attacks and the continued war in Gaza and the Northern Front. Despite the cancellation of the annual Air Force flight demonstration, the independence ceremony endured. A controversial decision to pre-record the usually live broadcasted torch lighting ceremony, attributed to security concerns and a desire to avoid disruptions, stirred debate. Historically, the Prime Minister had not generally addressed the state ceremony since it was seen as an apolitical event. And yet, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu appeared in a video with a patriotic speech. אבל היה לנו נשק סודי אחד, רוח הדורות, כוח החיים של עם עתיק שמסרב למות, עם שקם על מבקשי נפשו. Every year, 12 torches are lit during the ceremony by those who have made an outstanding impact for the good of the country. This year's torch lighters included soldiers, medical personnel, and civilians who saved lives on October 7th. One torch remained empty while the yellow ribbon appeared, representing the 132 hostages still in captivity. Many Israelis did not attend any festivities, and around 100,000 people gathered at an Independence Day rally in Tel Aviv's Hostage Square to hear speeches from survivors of October 7th, as well as those with family members still being held hostage in Gaza. Another event under the banner No Hostages, No Independence was held in the northern Israeli town of Binyamina as a protest against the perceived legitimacy of traditional events this year. Organized by Noam Dan, whose cousin remains in captivity in Gaza, the ceremony included extinguishing torches, conveying a somber counterpoint to the official state ceremony where torches are lit. As anti-Semitism rears its head globally, the celebration of Israel's existence, the sole Jewish nation, takes on added significance for some Israelis, representing a beacon of refuge and resilience in tumultuous times. And joining us now with more on Israel's Independence Day celebrations and the national mood the day after 
A special envoy at Israel's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and former Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem, Fleur Hassan Nahum. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So how would you characterize this year's Independence Day celebrations? I mean, there were celebrations, but not like in previous years, uh, I would say. Absolutely. I don't, uh, I can't remember a more somber Independence Day than this Independence Day. And when I moved here in 2001, we were in the middle of the Second Intifada, where bombs were blowing off in Jerusalem every week almost. And this is still way more somber this year. It's almost like instead of having the emotional roller coaster that normally is uh, Memorial Day for the fallen soldiers going into Independence Day to celebration, we almost had an extended two-day Memorial Day, and that was the mood. And really, you know, how can you blame people? Nobody feels like celebrating when 132 of our hostages are still in those terror dungeons. Absolutely. I mean, there were still uh, some celebrations, as you said, you know, toned down, very somber. It did seem like it was maybe a short one-day respite from the war, but then today we wake up to news that a soldier was killed and reality uh, sort of slaps you in the face. So how would you characterize the national mood today, you know, the day after? I think people are exhausted from being concerned Many parts of the populations are not in their homes and they have no idea when they're going to go back. We are facing an onslaught of, you know, not just hostile media, but hostile countries, hostile populations. And ultimately, we're still fighting this war. We still haven't gotten rid of Hamas. And I think people feel insecure. I think that's the word that I would use. And it's very difficult to celebrate when you have that feeling of insecurity. Absolutely. Well, Fleur Hassan Nahum, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. And let's hope uh, for brighter days ahead. Amen. Thank you. And now, Reichman University in central Israel is one of Israel's leading universities with a diverse international student population. The university recently held an event honoring its students who have rallied to help in the war effort. This Sunday, the university will be hosting an online info session, and you can find out more information by scanning the QR code. ILTV's Rachel Safdie was at the event celebrating Israeli resilience. Let's take a look. I'm here today in Reichman University in Ertelia, where nine of its students have been killed since the beginning of this war, and one has been held hostage to this day by Hamas in Gaza. We're here today for a Pesach luncheon, where donors, parents have come from abroad to celebrate those IDF reservists, the students, and Israeli resilience. Many Reichman University students were about to start the school year when the war broke out, and they were called to active duty in the reserves. From then on, Reichman University were also called to duty in supporting their students as they fought in the war against Hamas. Reichman University and the School of Entrepreneurship, we're so proud of for international students. We have students from almost 90 countries. It has not been an easy year, but we're proud to have shown our entrepreneurial spirit. And we basically tailor-made our degree for the different students. Some of them are in reserve, some of them are alone. And we create this strong community for them. We feel that they feel at home here, especially with what's going on in their home countries. We understand how difficult it is, and we're so happy to provide them the home that they need here. On October 7th, I got a call at 9 a.m., then went straight to the south. They have helped me to understand that my service in the army is so important at the moment, and that in the middle of a war, they will help me to figure out everything with my studies, so my mind will be clear for my service. I feel very proud to study here, because I feel in every speech we're doing, no matter for which event, we always have a word for the hostages, for the Miluinikin, for the reservists. And I think it's not the case in most of the universities in the world. I honestly think Leichmann University are doing this thing out of their shlichut, out of their tzionut. And this is something that is I'm so grateful for. Parents of international students also grappled with the anxiety of their children being deployed to war and relied on Reichmann University's assistance during this challenging time. I think Reichmann University has been amazing. I think what they've done for the reservists has really been 
incredible. Um, just coming here today to hear this reserve stories are inspiring. Um, and I just want to say how lucky we are to be on a pro-Zionistic campus where we can really do what we need to do and our kids can be proud to be Jewish based on what's going on anywhere else in the world. We're really proud parents. Thank you, Rachman. And now, let's take a look at the weather forecast. Clear skies are expected around most of the country tonight with lows of around 17 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Then tomorrow, we'll see more clear skies alongside steady top temperatures, seeing highs of about 29 degrees Celsius or 84 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our ILTV channel, subscribe to our ILTV newsletter, and don't forget to check out our website, ILTV.tv, with all the latest news from the heart of the state of Israel. I'm Lajar Gravelazi. Be well, and thank you so much for watching.